When it comes to New Zealand rivers, they don't come any bigger than the Clutha. The Waikato may be slightly longer, but this great waterway has by far the biggest flow. The volume of an Olympic swimming pool passes by every four seconds, and with it have flowed the hopes and dreams of generations, striving to make their fortune from greenstone and gold, hydropower, tourism and wine. This is the mighty Clutha. I'll be visiting some of the sources of this great river. I'll travel downstream through beautiful central Otago, past gold and wine country and the massive Clyde Dam, and on through Alexandra, Beaumont and the Rangahere Gorge, all the way to the river mouth at the Pacific Ocean. And this is where it all starts, high up in the Southern Alps, where the winds of the roaring 40s hit the high mountain ranges, rain and snow fall in abundance. I'm visiting one small part of the Clutha's giant catchment area, which encompasses 22,000 square kilometers in total. This is Mount Earnslaw right behind me, and I actually wish I was climbing to the top today. It's such a perfect day. This is the source, one of the many, many sources of the Clutha River. 60 kilometers of this high mountainous country with this locked up ice behind it and free flowing waterfalls below it is what creates New Zealand's largest river. It pours out of rivers like the Hunter into Lake Hawea, the Makarora and the Matukituki into Lake Wanaka. And over here where we are, the Dart and the Rees pouring into Lake Wakatipu. These are major, major river systems all converging to make the Clutha the single largest river in New Zealand. I feel very privileged to be up here in this pristine wilderness. This is a part of the world few people ever get to see. These beautiful, exquisite gardens, not of our making, are exactly why I love coming to the mountains. I mean, grass is just frozen in time. Zen-like mosses, shiny schist rocks, water just mesmerically falling out of the sky. I look up and it's just coming in slow motion and it rushes and hits a schist rock. I mean, to me, these are the essence of the Southern Alps. They're the essence of what we don't get in the city, what we don't get even out in the country, and why we need to seek out wilderness. All around me, water is cascading down. As the snow melts and the water runs downhill, right here, one of the Clutha's many sources begins to flow. But because rain and snow aren't constant all year round, rivers need a bit of help during the dry summer months, which is where our wetlands come in. They are like giant sponges, which absorb water during wet periods, and then release it slowly during the dry spells. I'm off to visit a very rare type of wetland at the head of the Nevis Valley with renowned ecologist, Sir Alan Mark. This is a very special landscape feature, special ecological feature, and in terms of water production, an extremely important hydrological feature because it stores water in heavy rains and releases it in drought periods like we have now, so that the low flows coming out of this wetland are constant and extremely valuable for water yield and water flow down valley. We find that about 86% of our measured rainfall finishes up in the streams as water yield. 86%, that's a world record. The snow tussock which surrounds it is very important in supplementing the water intake. Right. We can see a tussock just here. They're amazingly conservative of water use. Moreover, they're extremely efficient in catching water. These very fine leaves take, extract the moisture out of fog. We've shown that the tussock like this can strip a half a litre of water an hour from a fog when there's no measurable rainfall. So we know Mitre Peak, we know the Kiwi, we know a number of our icons, but you as an ecologist, I guess you would see this as an icon. Absolutely. I mean, there's nothing like it in New Zealand. It's special, it's internationally recognised, it's right up there. This is rather neat. I'm walking on a bog of sphagnum and sedges. It's actually a floating bog. It's floating on about a metre of water underneath it, and I'm floating on top of it, which is very cool. It's like being on a large sponge, but just cruising over the top. It's a very fragile place and I find myself almost a little anxious about walking around because you disturb it so much. Such soft 
substrate below me. We can't just let lots of people come up here because of their fragility. So it's especially wonderful to me to be able to come here and experience them, to encounter them, to take some photographs that I hope I can take back to people and just show what hidden gems there are in New Zealand. From high up in the central Otago Mountains, we can see just how all that water flows into the big southern lakes. This is the Dart River, and it is one of the major feeder rivers of the Clutha. It's also one of the best examples you will see anywhere of the effect of the glaciation. Just 10,000 years ago, major glaciers poured through the Southern Alps, and one came straight down the Dart here, thousands of metres up on the side. It compressed the valley floor. It pushed the sides of the mountains out into the U-shape that's classic glacial country. At the terminal face of this glacier, a large block of ice formed. It melted slowly and it formed Lake Wakatipu. After the glaciers, many of the gravels that have been ground up in the mountains during that period spread out across this landscape, carried by the Dart River into what we call a braided river system. They are extraordinarily unusual around the world. This is one of the very better examples you will see anywhere. And here today, in this late afternoon light, it is great for mountain photography. The Clutha River is fed from a massive catchment area starting high in the Southern Alps. Feeder rivers flow into the big southern lakes, Hawea, Wanaka and Wakatipu, which act as giant holding tanks for the tributaries which form the Clutha. The Southern Māori tribe, Naitahu, has a long association with the river they call Mata O. I'm joined on Lake Wakatipu by an eminent Naitahu leader, Sir Tipini O'Regan. As a boy, I remember the story of a Māori demigod digging great holes through the South Island and making the lakes. And the, the shape of this lake is renowned for the, well, the demon that stole the girl that the warrior Well, there's in. always a demon, uh, and there's always a, a warrior, and there's always a girl, and, and all these stories. The tradition, of course, is that uh, Matau, the Tanifa, was chased up here, and uh, he, um, he was killed, and he was cremated or burnt and his, uh, the fat and the fire and the intensity burnt this great hole uh, and then it was filled with water. How do you think your people first came here? A lot of the exploration of this area, of course, is to do with ponamu and to do with other valuable stones, the flints and the working stones, because it was a, a culture with no sort of metal. They came here and surveyed the whole of this landmass and named it um, very, very early in the Polynesian story, about 800 years ago. The river and the lakes, I mean, they're not an end in themselves. Often Māori, they were um, a through path to... Oh, absolutely, to absolutely. And this is where the cultivation of the mokiki, the uh, reed raft or boat, was uh, brought to a, a refined level greater than anywhere else in Polynesia. While Māori came here in search of greenstone, for the European, the big attraction was gold. The Central Otago Gold Rush began southeast of here in Gabriel's Gully in 1861. Over the next few years, around 18,000 prospectors flooded into the region, all hoping to make their fortune from the precious metal. The Central Otago landscape is dotted with relics from the gold rush. I'm heading to the old settlement of Sefferstown with local historian Angela Verry. So one of the first families to come in here to find gold and work it was in fact of Russian descent, I understand. Yes, Vasilo Sefovich, or as he became known, Sefer, he actually arrived the day after word got out um, among everyone that there was gold here. So when he arrived, um, according to his sons, there were around 2,000 miners camped down along the shores of the river, so he wasn't the first one here by a long shot, but his family lived here for the longest. So that's why it's called Sefertown. Yeah. yeah, and they lived here up until about 1939, 1940. So here is the Sefovich buildings, but are they the original ones, do you think? No, when the um, 
first miners all came and lived along Moat Creek in 1863. They would have all lived in tents. Oh, but right. as the family became more settled, this would probably be date around the 1880s, these buildings back here. Do we know how many at the peak were actually in this very small locale? We've got no specifics, but um, just general estimates range between two to 3,000 miners living in here in Moak Lake and in Moonlight as well, which is just okay. a wee bit further up. And how long did that last? I mean, two or 3,000 people here, when did it taper off, do you know? The Moak Lake rush in itself, it was a, a short-lived rush, I mean, two years maximum, but they did have quite good success in what they found in terms of alluvial gold here. And then later on, of course, and the Clutha became infamous for the fact that it had 180 dredges, and I think the most dredged river in the world, someone said. Yeah, well, again, it's that same concept as I just dig up Instead of getting the gold from the hillsides, they're trying to find the gold that was deposited in the riverbed itself. Mm. So they had big, sort of like a conveyor belt, and they'd have claws that would come along and just break up the river, and then the next um, item on the conveyor belt was a big bucket that would scoop it up, bring it up onto the boat, and they would use that same really simple process of using the water to wash away the sand and the silt and reveal the gold. And it revealed a lot of gold, didn't it? I mean, the Clutha, in world terms, it's a big river for gold, isn't it? It is a very big river for gold. They had nuggets as well as lots of lo little tiny, the flecks of gold that you look for, the alluvial gold. So we look at today, this morning, on quite an idyllic scene, but we certainly don't see much indication of several thousand people toiling away, a whole villages, you know, post office, shops. I mean, when we look down there, what, what remains? I mean, I can't see very much at all, to be honest. There's the old schoolhouse uh, remains down there. And if you look carefully, you'll be able to see poplars sort of planted in a box shape. And that would have been the windbreak for the house. So there's lots of remains like that and hedges. Now, if the gold value raises another few hundred dollars an ounce, will people come back here? I think so. There's definitely interest. It has been raised in people sort of looking to revive old gold mining towns. Mm -hmm. There's been interest out in Mace Town as well, so... There's still gold in them, the hills. There's still gold in them, the hills. And while I'm in gold country, I'm tempted to try my luck. There are two places, and two only really, where you're likely to find gold. One is in the motherload in the hills, that's in the schist rock, and in the bands of quartz. And associated with that, the gold lies out. But very few people, and virtually no one in the Clutha found it that way. Almost all of them found it in the river, exactly where I am, and they started off doing exactly what I'm doing, which is just panning for gold. But very quickly, the greed for gold drove methods that were quite destructive on the river. They started to make large waterworks and waterways that drove the water in high pressure to get under the banks, to scour up the banks, to work their sluice boxes. And even worse, during the early 1900s, they got into these huge dredges. That just scoured out the whole bottom of the river beds. That would have taken away all the fish habitat and been quite destructive. It takes a long time for a river to recover from that sort of treatment. But for the Clutha, there was worse to come. This is extraordinary. This is New Zealand's greatest river, the biggest river we have in New Zealand, the Clutha, pouring through the slipway at the Clyde Dam. And it just astounds me what humans can do to nature, to one of our wildest rivers, to just channel it to such a narrow scope and let it pour through this great concrete structure. Absolutely astounding. Never mind the gold rush. The biggest single event to change the face of the Clutha River was the construction of this, the Clyde Dam. It's New Zealand's third biggest hydroelectric dam after Manapuri and Benmore, and one of the most controversial. Back in the 1970s, there was huge opposition to the dam because of what it would do to this extraordinary area. But the project went ahead in the name of progress, flooding houses and orchards in the iconic Cromwell Gorge and creating the 26 square kilometre Lake Dunstan, where there was once a free-flowing river. Today, I'm getting a guided tour of the dam with Daniel Druce from Contact Energy. So that's an extraordinarily high slipway. I mean, how high is this dam compared to others? Uh, well, this one's about 60 metres high above ground as we look at it. 
Um, but you've got to remember there's another 40 metres that is going underground from this point. So it's 100 metres? About, yeah, nominally. I mean, almost everywhere in New Zealand has problems with earthquakes. I know it's the case down here as well, with the work done when they were building the dam. I mean, how do you mitigate it against our unstable land? Um, well, obviously, you build the biggest, strongest dam you can. Um, the dam's keyed into the rock um, on the sides of the dam. It's keyed in on the base of the dam as well. It's a million cubic metres of concrete, so it's fairly heavy. Clyde's also got a special feature, and then we've got a, what's called a slip joint here, which allows the dam to move in an earthquake and just ensure that its integrity Concrete. Remains. Moving. Yes. What's, what's the actual join made of? Oh, there's a big stainless steel plug that uh, is a, able to move in, inside a very large earthquake. That's extraordinary. Yeah. How much power do you get out of this dam on you know, New Zealand level? What, what are we supplying? Um, we used to be able to say we power Dunedin on an average day. That's enough power for around 100,000 people. But unfortunately, Dunedin's grown a little bit. So, um, But you get the idea of size. It's mm. big. We're heading down for a rear look inside the dam itself. And what's extraordinary is that not one, but two huge concrete walls have been built side by side. This is one of them, and this is the other one, and there's a gap of about, well, two metres between them. That's to absorb the mother of all earthquakes. It probably never happened, but if it did, they could compress together a little. But to me, it's like, well, it's like the mines of Moira in something like a uh, Lord of the Rings movie. You look up, a massive cathedral-like concrete structure. Absolutely extraordinary. And I guess in the worst of all earthquakes, we'd see these coming together a bit. I don't think we'd be here in the worst <laughs> of all earthquakes. <laughs> you make a good point. How long is the lifespan of, of this dam, do you think? Uh, it's a very long time. Um, for example, Roxburgh Dam, which was built in the 1950s, has just been reconditioned. Um, and it's as good as the day it was made. So, um, we expect the Clyde Dam will be here for a very long time. So we've got Clyde just downstream here. I mean, how safe are the people in Clyde? Oh, they're absolutely safe. There's no question of that. The, um, they've been living with the Clyde Dam since, well, it must be about like 25 years as a minimum now. So um, they've lived through it all. I'm curious to hear what the locals think after living so long in the shadow of the dam. I mean, at the time, there was a great deal of controversy. It was national about the dam. How do we feel these days in this area? On the whole, I think there's been certainly gains for... We live in Ernsklue, which is on the other side of the river, and we've ended up getting the best irrigation scheme in central Otago because of that dam. All gravity-fed, no cost. Yep. Um, absolutely brilliant. While there may have been gains for irrigation, for local orchardists like Peter Paulin, there were major losses. Fruit growing is very strong here. Uh, like Clyde here would have... Uh, we have about 80 fruit growers. Today we've got about six. The whole families, you went to the pub, if you didn't talk about fruit, you weren't in the, in the crowd, you know what I mean? <laughs> so in that respect, it's changed dramatically because there's no, no fruit growers at the pub now. And for sports people like kayaker Gordon Rayner, the river has changed for the worse. It was a really good rapid at Cromwell, where we used to, um, grade three rapid, we used to do a lot of kayaking. It was kind of the benchmark for kayaking in those days for kayakers from Southland and Otago and a really good grade two run all the way through the Cromwell Gorge down here to That's Clyde. a long run. Yeah, no, it's a big long run. It was really good. So, you know, that's now gone. It took me a long time to get over the dam mm. because we had lost so much amazing white water. And we were such a silent, small major uh, minority of people who had lost, you know, a, a big chunk of our recreational resources. But, you know, I got over it in time. And this is the effect of the dam. Up here was the wild Clutha River. It actually had some wonderful apricot orchards on the edge of it too. That's now Lake Dunstan. Over here, well, this is Cromwell. But it, it isn't Cromwell as it used to be. The old Cromwell, well, that's some 20 metres down under the lake here that's been created by the dam. And that's the Kaurau River flowing in. They were two wonderful wild rivers. Most of the original town was cleared for safety reasons. So all that's left beneath the surface is the old Cromwell Bridge. I'm curious to hear what other effects the dam has had on this waterway. Hi. How are you doing, Craig? Good, good. Cold out there? Oh, it's not too bad in dry sets, mate. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, big eels down there, lots of fish life or anything? I wish so, but no, no. It's, it's fairly, I believe that the water feels fairly uh, a little bit stagnant and uh, I think I've only ever seen about two trout there and the odd very small native bully fish, but very little fish life and uh, very, uh, not a lot of uh, freshwater native plants, just a lot of oxygen weed choking things up really, yeah. What, I mean, why do you think that is? Um, well, it's hard to say, but oh, it's just not really natural and I just don't think that the, the environment is, you know, best the way it was really. The dams here and further downstream at Roxburgh have changed the landscape of the Clutha forever. But there are proposals to build up to four more dams on the Clutha and another two on its tributary, the Nevis. I'm heading up the remote Nevis Valley with nomad safaris and an old comrade in arms, Forest and Bird Field Officer Sue Maturin. Sue and I fought to save Westland's forests back in the 1970s and now she's determined to save the Nevis. So Sue, the dam proposal, where's the dam going to be and, and how much land will it, will it flood? It's going to be two dams, one dam down here and another one further down and it's going to flood this part of the river and it will dewater right down by the confluence with the Kaurau River. It's the best part for kayaking. And then it will flood this entire valley, as far as you, the eye can see, up to those foothills there. So there's plenty of rivers in Otago. Some people might say, this is just another one, surely. But there's not plenty of rivers that don't have dams that, aren't, that don't have irrigation takes off it. And this is one of the, the last Central Otago rivers of any consequence that has no dams, no irrigation. It's pretty much unmodified and it's flowing in its natural state, right from up in the headwaters in the Nokomai down to the confluence of the Kaurau. A dam in this valley would threaten several plant and animal species, including a rare forget-me-not, a freshwater fish called Gollum galaxius and the Nevis skink. So, I mean, there's some wonderful natural history values, but there's a human history to this landscape to preserve too. Yeah, Nevis has a real legend. There's a kind of mythology attached to the Nevis. Everybody knows about it. It's this distant, remote place that has a long goldfields history. Believe it or not, there were five, 6,000 people living in this valley. Um, we had a, one town here and another town further down the valley. So we're going to lose a unique part of New Zealand's history as well as unique ecosystems. And we'll lose some of the best, um, most challenging uh, kayaking to be found in New Zealand. And even in the world, it's world-renowned kayaking in the Lower Nevis. I mean, people say the reason we're doing this, not because we love dams as such, but because we need power. How do you answer that? We do need power, and many people think that hydro is, is renewable. The water's renewable, but the ecosystem that you destroy when you create a dam and a lake, that's not renewable. No other generation would ever see what you and I are seeing here now, because once the dam's here, this ecosystem will be gone. Questions around the Nevis River make me very reflective. I mean, I'd rather just sit at a place like this and just hear the river song, just let the river flow, just allow it to be. But we have to be aware that people do require power. People want to dam rivers for irrigation. We also have to be aware, though, that there's a limit to how far we can go. It does seem at this stage in our society that we have gone a long, long way to destroying the natural and wild qualities of our rivers at the east coast of the South Island. We do need power, but is the price now just getting too high? Our wild rivers are as important as our forests. We've protected all of our forests. It's probably time we thought seriously about protecting all that's left of our wild rivers. Over the years, the Clutha has lured generations seeking their fortune from greenstone and gold, and most recently, wine. In less than 30 years, the Central Otago wine industry has grown from nothing to a $150 million a year business, due mostly to the area's world-renowned Pinot Noir. I'm visiting the godfather of Central Otago wine, Alan Brady, who planted his first vines here at Gibston Valley in 1981. And the evidence at the time was that you can't grow grapes in Central Otago, and so I have a, a stubborn streak, so I thought, well, why not? Um, let's give it a try. Alan's grapes are planted beside one of the Clutha's tributaries, the Kawarau, and the river plays no small part in the vineyard's success. 
microclimates, I mean, do you think they're related to the river at all? Well, we think it is. Um, and if you look in, in Europe, a lot of the great wine regions are, in, are on the banks of rivers, the Rhine, the Mosul, the Rhone in, in France, and many others. And they're there for a reason. Uh, sloping land that faces the right direction. The, the, the moderating influence that the river has on the climate, and, and that works in this valley. This river is a very fast-flowing river that drains the cold air away, creates a draft that helps to disturb the air and, and keep us relatively frost-free. We love that river and the look and the sound and the influence that it had. And wine is one of those very few products that can reflect a, a, a unique thing. The wine we make here can't be made anywhere else. It reflects this valley. I'm in for a special treat, a visit to Alan's remarkable underground cellars. A totally different environment in it's here. It's totally taken a while for my eyes to adjust. Well, this is absolutely wonderful, Alan. You've buried right into the banks of the Clutha River. In the bowels of the, <laughs> the schist. The schist, <laughs> yes, yeah, the yes. 200 million year old schist. Well, it was a logical thing to do because uh, in Europe they've stored wine underground for centuries. So why is it good for wine to store it in, inside a cave? in the side of a hill. It's a great environment for wine. It's stable. That's, that's the most important thing. Uh, temperature doesn't vary. Humidity is about right. And all of those things allow the wine to mature gracefully. So this is the library? Yes. This is the Holy of Holies. Uh, 25 years of winemaking history in here, Craig, um, including some very old bottles. This is. This is a pretty significant old bottle. This was a 1990 Pinot Noir from one of the first that uh, created any attention for Central Otago Pinot Noir. It won a silver medal at the Easter show and uh, created a lot of interest, not just in New Zealand, but overseas as well. And it's still tasting extremely good. A lot's been written about our mountains, our forests, and our coastlines, but there are too few voices for our rivers. Some shine out like painter Petrus van der Velden and his brooding cataract painting from the Oterra Gorge, James K. Baxter's love affair with the Whanganui River, and right here on the Clutha, poet Brian Turner and perhaps our greatest writer, Janet Frame, who wrote, I now came face to face with the Clutha, a being that existed through all the pressures of rock, stone, earth and sun linked to heaven and light by the slender rainbow that shimmered above its waters. I felt the river was an ally, that it would speak for me. Alexandra in the autumn is extraordinarily beautiful, and it's here that I am meeting Dame Gillian Whitehead, a leading New Zealand composer whose work has been hugely affected by the Clutha. She has written a piece for clarinet called Mata O, inspired by this great river. As I was writing it, the river was flowing past the window where I work and I kept looking at it and I'd been very taken with the idea of the two currents that flow, the, the deep one uh, which is what makes it a very dangerous river and the slower one on top and the interaction between the two. Mata'al refers to various concepts could be like the wake of a giant canoe, like moko, quickly written on the surface of the water, and the meaning of current and layer. And so all those came into the piece. I hadn't spent much time by the river until I came here, but since I've been here, it, it's... Um, uh, probably the foremost thing in my mind, really. Right. Runs right through your life at present. Yes, yes. <laughs> Literally. Yep. And how would you like people to regard this river in the future, and do you think your art help would help people see it a certain way? If anything that I write helps people to preserve the river, preserve it as it is, not tame it, mm. then that's great. I'm heading down the next stretch of river with my old mate Hugh Kennard. Hugh's an intrepid kayaker, but today we've chosen a more sedate way to travel, this dinky little inflatable raft. Say I fell, fell over. Yeah. 
and I'm in the water and I'm right down here. My head oh, will be there. I know this one. I you know, know this how one. To get me yeah, in yeah. There? Okay. You <laughs> grab me by the hair. <laughs> no, down you go. I grab here. Yeah. And you put me into the boat. <laughs> Is that right? Ah, yes. Yeah, and then I grab. Then down. you fall in. <laughs> then you fall in in the process. No, no, I stay. Oh, I've lost my pedal. Oh, oh there you go. Well, that's right. I got one. The pedal. And I'm nervous to see that even on this supposedly quiet stretch of the Clutha, there's clear evidence of white water. You see these eddies? You keep away from those sort of swirly things. Yeah. So we've got nice white water waves here. This is big enough. Oh, look at the size of that. Oh, God, look at that thing. Whoa. I don't like that. No. Look at that. Okay, keep going, mate. Keep yeah. going. Keep going. It's not over till it's over. No. There's still swirly bits down here. No, these look right. quite big, don't they? Yeah. Whoa! <laughs> Man, yeah. look at these whirlpools. I don't want to be in there. No. Keep away from that one. We can probably away from that, yes. I mean, how many people actually use our rivers? Well, Spark did a, a survey a couple of years ago and, and there were 209,000 something people went kayaking. And that's about the same number as played netball. And it's also a wee bit more than actually those people who indulge in snow sports like um, skiing and snowboarding. So it quite surprised me. And, um, and it just shows you that we, we like our rivers, we like our estuaries, we like our coastline for just poddling around in boats. Yeah. And yeah. there are some of us who like to do these journeys and we're following the footsteps of some of the rather brave people, you know, the original Murray explorers and um, who did this on flax stalk rafts, which I just absolutely am amazed that they would tackle this river. And it's in the days when before the dams... Before the, when the big rapids were there. The big rapids, you know, talk about um, 11 rapids of, of 11 feet high. Well, you know, that's absolutely incredible. It's three metres or so. Three metres, yep. It's distressing to learn that even this far down the Clutha, there's the threat of yet another dam. Right where we're paddling now is the site of one of the proposed dams that Contact Energy want to build on this river, another dam. And we'll end up with a whole lot of steps of lakes instead of what I would think of as a living, wild, continuous river. And I think we, we need to have a really serious debate about whether we need the energy and what do we need it for and what are we losing. I'm not suggesting we all freeze to death in the dark. No way. What I'm saying is that because there are so few of our rivers left, we really need to look at alternatives like wind and photovoltaic and saving energy and insulating houses and all those sort of things. And we need to put a much higher priority on doing those sort of things than we do for just going after the fact, well, there's a river, let's dam it. I think it would be really important for the next generation of New Zealanders to be able to do what we're doing now. I'd hate to think that this would just be a big flat lake. I'm taking the fast route down this stretch of the Clutha with Beaumont Jet Tours to visit a character named Bill Dacker. Hey, good to meet you. Yeah, good. Bill lives half his time in an unusual riverside retreat built by his father 80 years ago. Wow, so this is the patchwork house. The patchwork house, yeah. The recycled house, really. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. So there's an old gold mining flume pipe. A gold mining flume for the Yeah, for that was chimney. that my father found somewhere around here and he put this place together. There's a Model T Ford window on the other side. <laughs> you know, totally recycled, but in the 1920s. But it was the cook hut when, when uh, I was growing up. And, right. And the building at the back there was very much smaller. And that, oh, yeah. that was the main sleeping building. Yeah, yeah. This is the villa. This is the villa. So we can have a look inside? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My humble home, as it is. This, this, these beams here, these Kanuka poles, yep. were the original uh, roof of the, of the building, the original building here, which was a, a shed to dry the deer skins, as Dad was a deer colour in those days. This place has been added on to. Dad did most of it as the family grew. The river dominates the place. The sound of the river is our mm. constant companion. Yeah, we can hear it there. Because I kind of think of this as a, a river cottage, but I guess it was home. I mean, were there lots of homes similar to this in, in what uh, we call the old days? This, this was sort of unique, I think, to the era that I remember at Beaumont. There were lots of little huts once upon a time upon the river, that's true. Mm. But we're probably the last of them. Bill takes me to an outstanding spot in the Rongahere Gorge. The kilometre-long Birch Island has been described as an ecological Noah's Ark. As a conservationist, this is the most important part in the whole Clutha River, below the Dart River, below the major lakes, before we get to the ocean. And the reason for that is that this is native forest. It's all that's left of what once completely covered this whole area. 
What's it like around here? What, what sort of species are we mainly seeing? Well, here we're seeing an understory of small tortera, a lot of small tortera. Mm. The top story is a lot of mountain beach. Um, there's a wee bit of red beach amongst it. How is it left here when it was cleared everywhere else by Māori Māa hunter first and of course then by Europeans? This is, well, How, what, well, was this left? what was left? Well, it's, um, it's just this little corner, you know, the roads yeah. came in from that side, but they didn't go any further. The roads came down this way, they didn't go any further, and it left this bit here yeah. uh, untouched, except by the sawmillers. The sawmillers took out all the worthwhile tortera yeah. and matai, but they didn't take it all. What's phenomenal is the undergrowth and the, and the amount of small tortera tree. If you just look around here, you can, yeah. there's so many you, start, you end up not being able to count them all. So this will be a big tortera forest one day, because yeah. the... They will grow, keep growing. These other trees live, don't live as long. They'll fall over and die. And it also provides some sort of habitat for special creatures, huh? That's exactly right. And so, um, you know, rats don't get across the swift mm. river on both mm. sides. That's the main thing. Rats and mice. Mm. No, no, not here at all. Not only are the birds that live here safe from predation, such as the kakariki, mm. but that means also the, the undergrowth story that the insects that live uh, mm. down here they're safe from predation. It's from places like this that you could get regeneration. Yes, that absolutely. You could get the old New Zealand back. Yes. So healthy looking. You know? Cool. Let's go. When all the land for miles around has been lost to development, it gives me hope to see a small pocket of native forest surviving in the middle of the river. Bill has seen the river change dramatically in his lifetime due to the Roxburgh Dam, some 40 kilometres upstream. These banks were shaped like that once and now they're like that. That gravel bed behind us there was way up there and it's shifted down here. I mean, the gravel always shifts in a river like this, but there's no gravel replacing that gravel because of the dam has, has, has really changed that flow. And like many on this river, Bill is living with the threat of another proposed dam which could flood this entire area. What do you hope for the future for the river? I, I guess what one looks for is that it will stay here. Even as it is, it's just wonderful, you know? I mean, there is, I, I referred to it once as being sick, and I suppose the silt on the rock, it's a sign of its sickness. But it doesn't really matter. The river's still here, it's wonderful. If they build another dam down there, it won't be. <laughs> so, you know, and that, that's a real, real worry. It's, everyone in this community here have been living for a number of years with this sword sort of poised, and, and it's been uh, not, not very pleasant, really. So we hope that's resolved. I'm heading downstream to where the Tuapeka River joins the Clutha. At Tuapeka Mouth, I have to cross the river. There's no bridge, so I'm taking a punt, literally. Hi, I'm Craig. Oh, no, Benedict is my name. Yes. Oh, good to yes. meet you. Yes. And you're the ferry. This rare punt, or ferry, is yet another example of man harnessing the might of the Clutha, but in a good way. Now, tell us about this ferry, please. This is amazing. Yeah, it's been here for uh, since 1896 and it's been going sort of wow. continuously ever since. Yeah? Yeah. It's the only one of kind in the Southern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere? Yeah, yeah the only one of its kind. The river's current provides the power to get the punt across to the other side with cables and a rudder to keep it on track. Can I have a go? Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, great. Yeah. Show me the ropes then. Yeah. Yeah. You pull this forward a bit? Yeah. yeah. Swing around this way. I don't actually know what I'm doing. What am I doing? That's what the chain of the rudders. See ah. the rudders. On the, the rudders on the boat? Yes. Yeah. And that's angulating us out yeah. into the stream. Yeah. Hell, I'm going fast. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really steaming across the river. Pull it this way quick. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. This is a bit like one of these American cup boats, and I feel yeah. a bit out of control on it, actually. <laughs> this is a strong current, much stronger oh, than I yeah. expected. But we get in closer. Yeah, I don't want to hit that wharf. Yeah, I do not want to hit that wharf. That suddenly took off in there. There's yeah, a lot of power, isn't there? Yeah, that's where the main current is over here. Oh, OK, so I've gone through uh, the worst of it. Yep. Oh, it's a great way to get across the river, I must say. And the most remarkable thing about it in this day and age is that it's free, thanks to the Clutha District Council. Why don't we do this on more places? We're just using the power of the river. Yeah, I know, but, but uh, no, no one. No wants energy. To, uh, no one wants to use it. <laughs> this is this is thoroughly modern. I mean, this is a sustainable yeah, 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 way to get across the river. Yeah. Cheaper than a bridge. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, the dearest part of it is me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, it's been a great journey. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, good to go. Okay, mate. Yeah. Sure, the Tuapeka punt is a bit of a novelty but it's also a prime example of sustainability and using the river's power to good effect. 
Long may she run. As it rolls towards the sea, the Clutha splits into two branches, the Koa and the Matau, with a skinny piece of farmland, Inch Clutha, in between. The historic settlement of Port Molyneux dates back to the 1840s, and it's here that I meet my friend, southern author, Neville Peat. It was a thriving little town, uh, you know, two pubs and a whole lot of stores. Uh, and then uh, 1878, uh, September, October 1878, a series of floods came through here, the likes of which we've never seen. They were unprecedented. And virtually the whole lot, uh, all of the ports silted up and uh, it was killed, you know, just mm. killed off just within a matter of weeks. I mean, my feeling is that the Clutha has been host to a lot of dreams of humans, some of which have been quite destructive on the river, whether it be hydro, whether it be dredging for gold. I mean, these are very big schemes that have had a big impact. What would be your vision for what, how we should treat the Clutha in the future? One simple way, I mean, it's already been proposed and is under construction, at least at the, uh, at the Wan from the Wanaka end, is an I the idea of a, uh, of a walkway. Uh, and maybe bikeway that that would uh, extend the the length of the of the Clutha from one Lake Wanaka uh, down to the sea here, and I think if, when you introduce people to to the edge of a of a river as 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 mighty as the Clutha, you give them a sense of of of, of what it is of of the spirit of the river of of the of the river's natural values, obviously, mm. uh, apart from its scenic and landscape ones. And I think that that is more than anything would would help us appreciate its values. I've reached the end of a long journey, one of the longest you can take on a river. The Clutha, our very biggest river. And I have sort of mixed ambivalent feelings at this stage because I think humans have put a lot of dreams on this river, from the moa hunters to the greenstone gatherers to the gold hunters, and more recently, of course, those that have looked for hydro as a way to get something out of this river. And I think for all that we've done to this river, we also take a very positive feeling out of it. And people have just spoke nothing but fond thoughts about how wonderful the Clutha River is. It is a great river, it has a wildness. Yes, we've damaged it, but it has a future, and this river will keep going way beyond all of our crazy dreams. <laughs>